Hi, I'm Nick. Uh, and I'm Helena, and we both work at the MS Trust, a UK charity for people affected by MS. And just as a little disclaimer, we're still recording this over Zoom, so apologies if it's the sound is iffy at any stage. Welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis podcast, breaking it down, and also a big welcome to the new year, to 2023. We're going to kick off our year of podcast by talking a little bit about what we're hoping to happen with the podcast and in the world of all things MS this year. And I will be chatting to uh, Rachel Horn a bit later on, uh, who is a journalist with MS and who is working um and also has a sort of special interest uh, within uh, the world of MS research. And I'll be catching up with her uh, and about her sort of diagnosis story and her life with MS and the research that uh, she has been looking at um, and, and the research that she's hoping to see more of. And Rachel is also, this is very exciting, she has launched the Rachel Horn Prize for Women's Research in MS and we'll be asking her about that as well. And later on, I'll be talking to Helen, who's one of our education team members for health professionals. And we're going to be talking about some of the different training that the MS Trust does with with MS nurses. But first, let's kick things off with some news from the MS Trust for our 2023 um, the first biggie is that for MS Awareness Week this year, we're hoping to work with lots of different MS charities in the UK um, to provide lots of events and um, information for the MS community. And it's also a special year for us because it's officially the 30th year of the MS Trust. Um, so we will be having lots of special birthday events. So keep a lookout for some of those and different ways that you can all get involved in the 30th birthday of the MS Trust. Happy birthday to us. Very exciting. <laughs> um, we also have some uh, more publications and online content planned for the year. Uh, and there's obviously lots of uh, podcasts coming out. Uh, and we do our best to to sort of get them out every three weeks uh, or so. And we try to cover all sorts of topics, uh, uh, topics that we know that people are asking us about at the MS Trust and ask the inquiry line about. Um, but also things that we you know, pick up from from the the ether about what's what people are discussing. But if there are any topics that you would like to hear us cover, please do, do get in touch because uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, how about maybe dropping us an email on comms at mstrust.org.uk? Leave us a, a voice note on WhatsApp on 0745830332. Uh, we we don't actually answer any questions on WhatsApp, just to, to bear in mind. So if you have any questions, you'll have to contact us uh, via the uh, inquiry line. And that phone number is in the show notes and we'll tell you it later on as well. Uh, the next episode of the podcast is going to be about altered sensations. I'm very excited about this one because this is a big, big topic within the MS uh, world. So these are all your weird pins and needles and all creepy crawly, sometimes painful feelings like numbness and, and tingling and, and itching and all sorts of odd things that goes on. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. I'm lo looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that as well, Helena. So we've got lots lots in the pipeline this year. As, as Helena said, we're looking forward to hearing from you too. Um, but for now, we'll move on to our first guest, Rachel Horn. I'm going to kick off this first podcast of uh, 2023 uh, with our first guest. And this is somebody who I'm very excited about having on the podcast because we've been following her on, well, at the MS Trust, we've been following her for, for a long while and I've been following her on Twitter, Twitter as well. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to Rachel Horn. Do you mind saying hello and, and telling us a little bit who you are and what you do? <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for having me on here. I'm also a big fan of yours too. And, you know, happy new year. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Canada and grew up in Canada, but I've lived in the UK, in London for the past 30 years. And by profession, I'm I'm a journalist. Uh, my background was more in international news and financial journalism until I came into, into you know, medical covering MS and medical, uh, medical and science issues. And I live in London with my husband and we have two 
two adult children. And um, so I spend some of my time t- writing about MS, uh, you know, on Twitter, on the MS research blogs, and also as a co-author on scientific journals. Also, um, I'm in a very fortunate position through a, a family foundation in Canada to be able to give money to um, a number of programs, most of which support MS research and uh, treatment, looking to treatment, and but also um, some projects which support women and, and, and girls around around the country, um, sorry, around around the world. And also, I like uh, walking, um, horse riding, and also. Uh, mudlarking, which um, for whoever is not aware of it, is when you're going on to, especially in the Thames during during the 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 the, the, the COVID sh- uh, shutdown, going onto the Thames of the River and looking for objects uh, which were left there hundreds of years ago. Um, I've never heard of that. That sounds really interesting. Oh, you haven't? <laughs> I think I'll have to come in and do that. Uh, we'll have to uh, make a date and do that in the summer. Maybe that'd be interesting. <laughs> Not now when it's a bit cold, but... No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe you were diagnosed in, was it 2009? Yes, that's right. In, in the autumn of 2009, when I was 43, um, I could... Uh, I just, um, I can tell you a little bit about yeah. it if you like my own sort of diagnosis story. Yes, please. Um, um, yeah, like a lot of people with MS, and I don't know if this is something that you, it rings a bell with you, is I had a number of kind of odd symptoms in, in the lead up to my diagnosis, which sort of waxed and waned. So I pretty much dismissed them. Uh, and then in the, um, and then in 2009, uh, I had a started to having tingling in my right hand, pins and needles, which over the, the next Next week uh, came down the right side of my body. So by the time I showed up at my GP, uh, I couldn't walk very well. I had um, vision problems, balance, uh, and couldn't really uh, able to use my right hand properly. Now, why I didn't earlier go in? Because I was a bit of a mess when I showed up mm. uh, to an A&E. I don't know. I think in the back of my mind, I kept on thinking things are going to get better. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, uh, putting myself into denial. Um, my GP then sent me very quickly out for an MRI. And the next week I was um, admitted to a hospital in, in London, um, into, into the National Hospital in Queen Square, where I was started on steroids. So I was there for a couple of days. And uh, again, um, I, it was a complete uh, it was a complete shock to me. Up until then, I was you know active. I considered I'd eaten well. Um, I'm looking after myself, doing all the right things. And also, I knew very little about MS, mm. and it certainly wasn't anybody in my family that had been affected by it. So it, it you know it was a huge shock to me. But the diagnosis then came on fairly quickly after straight on after that yeah very much I think because I had had such a severe attack you couldn't Mm. really push it aside but no I did go through the the traditional you know the evoke potentials test that was carried out um uh MRI on on the brain and spine and a lumbar puncture which confirmed it and also the blood test which ruling out other uh Mm. uh, you know other, other conditions so for me the diagnosis was very swift but I think because I presented with such um you know severe symptoms yeah. I suppose as a journalist, what, what was your reaction when you were diagnosed? Did you want to like learn everything about MS or was it, you know? Yes, no, very much. And I think I'm one of those people that, um, uh, and I, you know, and uh, that was uh, sort of told everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think it was quite obvious that I was in a bit of trouble and mm. that something had happened to me. So I couldn't really hide that. Uh, yeah, so I did. So I d- did try and find out as much as possible. But I think also it's worth bearing in mind, and I know you uh, mentioned that you were diagnosed in, what was it, 2007, did you yeah. say? Yeah. There wasn't as much information no. available. You know, today we're just so used to the internet and going on. So there was a lot of searching and there was a lot of older information. Yeah. So I remember being quite thrown, you know, life expectancy, um, you know, elite, you know, 10 years uh, below everybody else's. Mm. And I think also the drugs had only come on um, and, uh, you know, since what is it about 1996. So there wasn't mm. any long term studies about how that was, how that, you know, how that was panning out for people. So I don't know about you, but I did feel very overwhelmed and and quite alone. Mm. No, and I mean, I even think I had one of those, you know, the dummies guide to MS, like an actual book. book. Yeah, it was, I know, of course, there was still the internet and stuff, but a lot of the things were 
there was a lot of fishy stuff out there, I have to say. Yes, and there still is fishy stuff. Yes. You know, you go on there and there's a lot of, you know, take this and cure your MS and mm. reverse your MS. But I do think there wasn't as many, um, uh, yeah, it was. It took, I think, a lot more rooting around, don't you, to, to find information on MS. And there was a lot of doom and gloom out there too. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but, and, and I think, you know, there was social media sort of just about starting as well, but it wasn't yes. all the organisations like the MS Trust or the MS Society, they weren't really out on social media so much back in those days either. So I guess you really had to go find stuff rather than now you can sort of go on any social media and, and just type in MS and you, you'll you have all the organisations sort of being there, won't you? Yeah, and I think that's absolutely right. And I also think I was obviously older. I was you know, 43. And what then I just noticed that, say, Shift MS when they started to come on board. And as you said, the MS Trust and the MS Society. But it did seem to me, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, it was more before back then, it was a bit more geared towards the older, okay. say the older population that had had MS for quite a long time. So I was rather hesitant to go into, say, an MS, you know, a, a social mm. and see people in, say, wheelchairs that had had it for a long time. And I, so I think I did stay away from that kind of, you know, grouping, meeting fellow people with MS, because I'm probably scared of lo- joining these groups and looking into the future and thinking, oh, gosh, that's going to be me one day. Mm, no, same. And I think I, even some MS nurses back in those days said to me, oh, you probably don't want to join a group, which I, I did kind of feel like, well, that's sort of up to me, you know. And and, and I feel yeah. like now, having had MS a few years, I I, I do like going to um, MS Society branches and things like that, yes. meeting people, because I, I think it's really valuable to meet people that have had MS for many years. But when you're newly diagnosed, that could be quite scary. It's absolutely. And here we are kind of, you know, you know, kind of laughing and smiling about it. But I think, as you said, it's only when I think I uh, reach sort of acceptance yeah. that you know, I love, you know, I, I think it's great to meet other people with MS because you have an, uh, an immediate connection, don't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you don't have to explain. You don't have to. It's just all just there. And I think I found for the most part, everybody with MS is just incredibly supportive because they know what it's like to live with an incurable disease, which, you know, thankfully can be treated. But, um, you know, it's it's it can be quite a, you know, a solitary journey. So I think it's important to meet other people with it. Yeah, absolutely. So sort of from a day to day basis then, because it's uh, 2009. I mean, there's a few yeah. years now and, and you, you weren't put on any treatments then. No. And, you know, look, it, it, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't yeah. it? But again, I think back then and, and um, you know, things have changed, obviously not probably as much as we wanted, but it was very much my neurologist. It was very much a wait and see. Yeah. Um, let's see how you get on. If you have another attack, let me know. Um, yes, I wish in hindsight that I'd said I want to be put on something mm. uh, right now. But they also they, they, the, the treatments, they weren't I mean, here. We've got nearly what is it up to nearly 20 treatments. Yeah. Uh, and, and back then there just wasn't that. It was a handful. Um, so I. <clears throat> I wasn't on any treatments. And then over time, because the, the relapses continued, I was on Capaxon uh, injecting every day. And then I was bumped up to uh, Tecfidera, which, as you know, is an, you know, an oral medication. And then the last three years, I've been on a Crevis, um, yeah, which seems to work for me, um, you oh, know, just funny. Yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. So on a sort of day to day basis now, are you are you fairly stable or, or how are you feeling with symptoms and things? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I do have symptoms. I have um, permanent double vision in left in my left eye, uh, which it's funny because you do get used to it. Um, mm. You do. I just tend to t- turn my head a bit more uh, and obviously wear prism glasses when I'm driving. Um, and I do have um, foot drop on my left hand side, so- uh, left side, um, which uh, so sometimes I have to wear a you know, a brace if I'm going for a long distance walk. Um, the the biggest thing for me, and I don't know how you are with it, is is fatigue. Mm-hmm. Um, because, I, and I think because it's so unpredictable and it's yeah. so uncertain, you know, you can wake up in the morning with huge plans for the day or um, something to really look forward to and find you just don't have the energy to do it um, or else you you get have loads of energy and you kind of grab it and you take advantage of it yeah. and you 
yourself too far and then you suffer the next day so even after 13 years I still haven't found that balance and I think um it's just the unpredictability it's the uncertainty and also having to let people down around you Mm -hmm. on your plans that I think is quite tough it is tough because I feel sometimes I'm much better in the morning than I am in the afternoon so I quite often have to turn down sort of social stuff in the evening and then you stop people stop asking you if you want to come to the things and you sort of still kind of want to be asked but yeah. you, you and you, but you still feel like oh I don't want to be the rude person that always says no as well so it's, it's hard to find that kind of balance it is isn't it and as you said I'm much better in the in the mornings too so I tend to sort of schedule things in the morning whereas I know sort of an afternoon meetup um yeah or or um again having to postpone or cancel invitations and you and you do miss out and it is sometimes difficult because uh, you know looking at you and I right now we look perfectly fine don't we it can be hard to explain and a fatigue is such a hard thing to explain I do yes. that does it again when you're saying about meeting other people with MS you kind of you just need, almost need to share the look and it's like yes you know, fatigue. Yeah. oh yeah exactly where it's like oh you know you and you say oh you know oh okay I'm having to cancel again and and I think we all get it because you, you can sort of see the look in somebody else's eyes thinking really you yeah know, are you Tired. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about um, your work because um, obviously you you write for the uh, the the Bart's blog is called something different now, is it? It's the MS blog. So, yeah. MS yeah. blog. Yes. Um, and but you have written a, a few pieces about about MS and and I was saying before I press record that one thing that I have loved about your articles is that you you are not shying away from actually asking some difficult questions, <laughs> and um, coming on to talking about the. the the price that well, but I, I shall be quiet about that one for a second there but but you really have a, a, a quite a focus about why women have been quite neglected in the world of MS which is a bit crazy since most people with MS are actually women no absolutely and I think maybe it's by my, my sort of background as a journalist uh, that I, I yeah I feel I feel I, that I can ask these questions because I do think also neurology, the profession itself is quite conservative. Mm. Um, so there are, um, so maybe it, it, it did help that somebody who was from the outside and that was a person with MS would ask these questions. Uh, but it did strike me. I, I think what happened was um, I was writing for the, you know, from a patient perspective or a person with MS perspective on the, on the MS Bart's blog or the MS blog. And I was invited by Professor Gavin Giovannoni at, at Queen Mary to attend um, Ectrums, which we all know is the um, the largest MS annual conference in research and treatment in MS in 2018. So when I went there, I was pretty surprised um, was how underrepresented women were as, as neurologists and neuroscientists speaking. And obviously that has changed now quite dramatically. I, th- I think the, the speaking ratio now is it 50 50 but back then I sort of counted and it was about two-thirds of the speakers uh taking the stand um were, were men and um so their voices were being heard their research was being put out there and what I also noticed was that um how uh, very little mention was made of women with MS it was very much under patients mm. and I think we we're very much seen as kind of um generic men but with boobs and tubes, to put it bluntly. Yeah. <laughs> and there was very little mention of um, our specific health issues, be it um, managing reproduction, pregnancy, breastfeeding, and, and menopause. And as you said, considering most people who get MS are women, and, and that's growing. And, and, you know, why wasn't that being, you know, another issue being addressed? You know, is it hormones? Is it you know, um, vitamin D? Is it, uh, you know, well, why is this happening? Um, and I was just also going to mention another thing. It was actually through the, um, you know, the MS, uh, they do an annual um, conference. Mm which is absolutely fantastic. And what happened was in March of last year, so March of 2022, Dr. Ruth Dobson was um, invited by you, by the MS Trust, to give a lecture on MS and menopause. And she asked if I would co- uh, contribute something from a, uh, and I think it's no surprise, I'm you know, menopause and of, of a certain age. And while I was doing research into it, I noticed that of all the thousands of papers published about MS, in the last 40 years, there'd only been 10 on um, women and the menopause in MS. And, you know, considering almost, you know, every woman with MS will go through the menopause, 
it seemed as a huge short failing. And also that the, the people writing those, those studies were women because it's something they were familiar yeah. with. They, they got. Um, so I don't think, it, you know, I don't think it's some grand conspiracy no. that, you know, male, male uh, scientists are trying to keep women down, but they just probably don't think about these issues as much as, as women do. So that's, um, for me, those were two big moments. Um, that's why it sort of led me to set up um, the, you know, the prize for women's research in DMS. Oh, and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. As I said, I think um, it, the women's issues had been overlooked and mm. women's scientists had been. Um, and, and there is, and I think we're well aware, there, there are quite strong rooted institutional biases. Um, women neurologists and neuroscientists are paid less. There are less leadership roles or less um, on, on, on journal editorial boards. Uh, and I think I think change is coming, but it's coming slowly. Mm. Uh, so what I realized what I could do, though, was to set up an MS a prize for for women's researchers. And so it was kind of saying, here's the the women researchers. Here's what they're doing. Um, and, and when they when they do the research, then we, the women with MS, benefit. So um, it seemed to me, uh, you know, and also it was also a thank you to all of these women researchers um, to saying thank you for doing what you're doing. You're facing these challenges um, and, and um, here's, you know, let, let's sh- shed a light on you and, and reward you. I think it's a fan- fantastic initiative. And one thing I find, in, you know, a very exciting um, since sort of being diagnosed in 2007, and it's only really been, say, in the last five years or so, four years or so, that I've seen some 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 female neurologists. And I think the first time I actually had one in an appointment, I think I almost squeaked a bit. And I <laughs> thought, like, maybe that was, you know, a bit weird for her, but it was just like, I, I just thought it was so exciting because y- y- it tends to be an older white man <laughs> that you go and see. And it was just nice to see. And now, you know, having done this job and interviewing yeah. people and I've had Ruth Do- spoke to Ruth Dobson, who is brilliant. And we've had quite a few female neurolog- neurologists on here. And, and it's just, it's nice to see that it's, it's, it's there's changes happening. Uh, absolutely. Um, and I think also that there's a lot less reticence about saying things like, and again, which I think this is not just in the MS world, but say menopause, mm. which you often used to say in kind of a hushed tone of voice, wouldn't you? Yeah. You know, I'm going through the change. Um, so no, I, I, I think there is a sea change out there. It is happening slowly. And, for, you know, obviously we want these things to happen quicker, but I, th- I think, I think it is coming through. Yeah, you know, yeah. and and it's interesting because you know they always make that joke saying that if if men were giving birth, then there would be much more pain management to to do with uh, delivery of of babies. But but um, I do think it's kind of interesting with the amounts of drugs that we have. That is very very few that have gone any sort of testing when it comes to uh, breastfeeding. Yes, absolutely, um, and I think that's coming through. And also, I uh, when I was at Ectrums um, just uh, in you know the, in October last October, there was a study presented on about IVF, and would that affect you know again these things which which um, which because I uh, I you know was diagnosed when I was older, yeah. so it's very different from you when you were probably thinking w- what does this mean for somebody with MS who wants to start a family or is it possible? I mean we all know until very recently um, women with MS were discouraged from having children. Oh, really? Yeah, so yeah. I, I think I think this is just all leading in so that women with MS who are what we know are typically diagnosed when they're 30, they um, can get on with their lives and, and do what, what, what they're uh, and not, not feel that they have to limit their lives, which I think is, is, it's all about information, isn't it? And research. Mm. I remember being on one of these um, panels that um, NICE had put together when they had some uh, people sort of presenting some ideas for some new drugs and things. And I was sort of said, what about breastfeeding? And it was almost like someone was going, "Oh yeah," and everyone was kind of thought, but, "But why? Your 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 audience is predominantly going to be a female in her thirties, so why should you not be thinking about these things?" But exactly, and she's <laughs> probably thinking about starting a family, or she already has a family and expanding it. And also, I don't think it's I don't I think it's actually quite poor science when you just focus on you know one um, gender or one yeah. sex. Um, because we are different, uh, you know, and at a very deep cellular level. So it, it makes sense, especially in the age when we're moving towards personalized medicine, 
why not recognize these differences? Um, and we were, you know, MS is, is different for each person. So why, you know, why why can't, shouldn't we take into effect um, how, th- how that affects us? Um, you know, the ages and, and then the sex differences and, uh, yeah, to do with reproduction, treatment, um, all those kind of issues. It was interesting what you were saying when you that it took you a long time before you actually ended up going to hospital, even though things had sort of been happening a bit. Do you think that that could also be a little bit like as women, we hear quite a lot of the times that people just get on with things. It's just, you know, just to get going. And then you, then you hear these horrible stories about women who go to the doctor and they'll be like, no, 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 no. It's it's nothing. You, you're just, I don't know, perimenopausal or it's this and it's that. And then it actually turns out to be something like MS. <laughs> Yeah, I think medical gaslighting in MS is a very big issue. And uh, I've sort of been looking into it more and more. But for exactly this, the reasons you pointed out, I think women are told, um, you know, pain is, 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 is you know, it's a, at the time of the month, menstrual or childbirth or whatever, the, the, the pain, we should just accept it. It's just part of being a woman. Uh, and also, I think it's very difficult with MS because so many of the symptoms are invisible. Mm-hmm. Um you know, uh, uh, problems co- with cognition or uh, numbness or mm. pain or, um, uh, and it's very difficult to measure. Whereas, you know, an oncologist or a cancer specialist can look and do, you know, one test and decide whether it can dictate whether or not you have cancer or they can measure a tumor. With, with MS, it's, 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 it's you know, because also the symptoms come and go, it's very difficult. And so I do think there has been quite a bit of medical gaslighting when it comes to conditions like MS, especially because it hits women and because some of the symptoms are are invisible all fingers crossed that it's yes. it's moving into the right direction now and uh, bring them back to 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 your prize who who can nominate people then for for, for the prize and what sort of criteria are there for, to to nominate someone sure. um it is going to the nominations you have to be nominated by somebody in in the ms scientific community so a, a neurologist neuroscientist a you know researcher and anybody can um in that community can nominate you know a man or a woman um can nominate one of their peers. Uh, and also, I wanted to make it as simple as possible, because I do know, um, especially if you're a, a woman researcher, there's a lot of demands on your time. So it's mm-hmm. essentially, um, to put in your application, it's one page, obviously, citing your, your journals, and it will be looked at, uh, the judging is done by um, international women in the MS who are, uh, there'll be a panel, we haven't decided quite yet, but I think it's a panel of about five or seven um, uh, members of uh, international women in MS who will change, um, and they will look at the applications um, and 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 sift through them. And I think we also wanted to keep it quite loose, not just saying say it's it's mid to late career uh, researchers. You know, pro- uh, I think initially it will be that, but then sort of switching things and saying, well, hold on, this this year we'd like to encourage um, women from um, say more of the developing countries, uh, Asia, Africa, to put in. Yeah, so I think just having that flexibility, so you're going to you're going to see a shifting, so that it's kind of open to to all women, um, not just the usual, um, you know, North American, European. Um, specialists yeah oh that's that's really good I think you know to to sort of make it a global thing yeah then. yeah so when when are you are you planning on having a ceremony or what <laughs> yes oh yes what we're going to do is it's my understanding that it'll be announced that the applications are opening at Actrums mm-hmm. which is at the end of February in in San Diego so applications will be open uh, and then the uh, the judging uh, system will, you know, the, then there'll be the judgments and the uh, the prize will be awarded in Milan in um, 2023. And also they will, uh, this is very much supported by, you know, by Ectrums. So that's when there will be, that's when the award will be given. And as I think it'll be, you know, 40,000 US or, or what, how that translates to wherever the researcher, the equivalent, and it's no strings attached. So if they want, to go to Las Vegas, um, go ahead. <laughs> the money they don't have to link it to research in MS. It's it's um, yeah. So that's uh, oh, that's, that's lovely. Uh, yeah, I, and I, I guess you will be able to see an awful lot of interesting research then, hopefully as well. <laughs> 
As I said, I, I, I'm no neurologist, um, that's pretty obvious, but I think at the very end, um, they probably want somebody in which I'm going to do, and and, and just to sit there and to, to hear uh, what's important, and, and, and yeah, so as I said, I, it's pretty much a hands-off until I think the very end, and I'll, yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll be having some impact, yeah, some, 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 yeah, some influence. Yeah. It's funny. One of my colleagues, um, Janice, she like writes up these uh, research updates um, that we put out now and again, and um, she plows through all these like super technical things. And you know, some some things I can understand by the headline, and I think, aha. <laughs> <laughs> but then other things you could might as well be been in 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 Latin or Greek. I don't know. It's 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 so complicated. But it. <laughs> no, I very much agree with you, and I think this kind of movement, which I'm sure you're aware of, of the plain language summaries. Mm. Um, which I think is great because I think it's so difficult, you know, and I think we share the same things. I'm not from a science background and I can kind of, you know, some of the headlines I can get and sometimes the conclusions, but I think just having, making um, MS research accessible. So people with MS realize that all these things are happening and what it means to them, because it can be quite overwhelming, can't it? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I feel like there's a lot of people within the MS community that really want to read about research as well, because it does give a hope and and an and interest on, on things. And it's also that, aha, well, that happens to me and is there. But then there's some, I mean, there's some funny, wacky ideas out there as well. But I, I, one of the most popular things that we keep on uh, putting up on social media is that Coco could help um, with fatigue. And it's just like, because people know, oh, well, I can actually try that myself. You know, it's not, not something that's, overcomplicated you any kind of research that you can apply to yourself rather than having to be in a in a medical medical trial and stuff it's it's yes no I agree with you you know sort of do this one thing yeah uh but as a cocoa kind of chocolate well hold on I can do that yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. what areas of research would you like to see start happening in the in the next year then yourself well for this year I would love to, I mean I think there's a lot of ex- very exciting things going on in MS research and I, I'm not just saying that because uh, you're in front of me um, uh, but I do think uh, there's been uh, interesting um, movements in uh, personalized medicine because um, I think and I, I don't know how you feel about this. I think, you know, MS has been a neurological success story and for the last 25 years there's so many drugs available so I think that's quite wonderful so now I think we're moving beyond that and say look we do have treatments yes you have MS and you'll probably have to be on treatments for the rest of your life but now I think you're allowed to you know there's much more bringing in uh we're moving to the next stage and and personalizing being able to personalize those treatments and the use of you know artificial intelligence to be able to scan through millions of MRIs what's the best course for you um so that's one thing is personalized medicine, which I think, and also um, very interested in um, the, the the relationship between the Epstein Barr virus mm. and MS, and you know very strong evidence that it does trigger it. You know how we don't know why we don't really know, but being able to you know let's look at possibly anti was it retrovirals to treat people with MS who've already you know who already have MS um and also uh, p- possibility of vaccines i mean we've seen what amazing things the vaccine did with the coronavirus mm. um, so you know can you imagine you know you and i having a conversation in you know in a generation and saying um it looks like MS you know we've got this vaccine and it doesn't exist anymore i mean that to me would be incredible and you wouldn't have to worry about your children getting it or their grandchildren getting it so i think those two things and obviously also women in, you know again going back to um treatments that focus on uh, you know women in, you know women with ms um and and how we can uh, you know aid and support women with ms who, who you know with the disease yeah I think one thing that's been interesting talk about menopause because not only in the ms world but like I guess it was that documentary that Davina did that it was almost like suddenly people went, hang on, is there such a thing as menopause? Which is is so crazy because, you know, we're, like you say, 50% of the, the world's population will most likely go through menopause at some points yes. in their life. Um, so I, I think it, it it's it's nice to see that there is sort of research being done in there but I find personally myself I'm I'm a bit sort of perimenopausal at the moment (laughs) and when there's stuff going on I never really know to say whether it's MS related or if it's one thing or another I've had random piece pain and bladder problems and it's like what what's doing what and it's I do I find it quite hard when you go to the health professionals and they see MS in the list there as well. They'd be like, well, that's that's why it is. 
yeah. I eventually got like a scan done and then they figured out that the bladder problem that I thought was MS related was to do with uh, fibroids and, and cysts and things like that. And, it, you know, it's it it's a hard field to navigate. I find there's a lot of stuff going on down there. It is really, isn't it? And that's the same thing that happened. I was convinced my MS was getting worse because I would have these symptoms. And as you said, so many of the symptoms, I don't know, about 20 symptoms, you know, correlate. So I was thinking, gosh, my MS is going to, is, is, is getting worse. I've got to go on to a, you know, a stronger drug. Mm. Um, and what got me is, is that, I, you know, I was quite surprised my MS nurses or my neurologist didn't sort of say, well, look, let's face it, you are in your late 40s. This could be linked to, to the, you know, to, to menopause. Because I think I have a tendency, probably like a lot of people, to blame everything on MS. Yeah. Uh, because it's got such a wide range of symptoms. Um, and I think because the nature of, uh, of menopause, because it affects so many different areas, um, the, the, there isn't, you know, you have to kind of connect the dots. Um, and, and, and sometimes it can be very difficult, isn't it? Because again, there's such a wide range of reactions. You know, some people seem to sort of float through, women float through the menopause and other people have a really difficult time. Um, yeah, so I think that's been, uh, th th you know, again, let's see if, if uh, I know there's some very interesting work coming out of, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Riley Bow, out of um, University of California, I think. Um, and she's been doing some fascinating work on, on women in menopause and with MS. Is it getting, you know, will your, does your MS get worse? Mm. Um, you know, and, and can we create some sort of, you know, biomarkers to see how you're going to do? So I think such, there's a huge amount of research to be done, but um, at least it's being done, which I yeah. think is great. One thing that I've always thought would be very interesting to see more about as well as sort of hormones and pregnancy and things yes. like that, because I don't know about you, but when I was, I've been, sort of after diagnosis, been pregnant twice. And the first time, um, a lot of my symptoms that I was having on a daily basis sort of stopped while I was pregnant. Um, and, and I felt, apart from being pregnancy tired and morning yeah. sickness and that sort of bit, I felt fantastic. It was, it was you know, MS-wise, I, I probably didn't feel like I had MS during those uh, nine months of, of, of pregnancy. Um, so it, it's sort of very interesting to know how did you feel? How did you feel after? Because isn't that quite sometimes a quite difficult time? Because obviously, you've had your child, you know, mm. your baby, you're exhausted, you're tired, your hormones are crashing. How did you feel afterwards? Well, I was sort of almost expecting to have a relapse then because I had had quite a lot of relapses before falling pregnant. And then I, I was so stable during the whole time. So I was almost expecting something to happen. Um, but it didn't. I didn't actually have any relapses until after my second uh, son was born, but then I got optic neuritis and something else. And that's when they put me on treatment because I was very much like you that they said, oh no, you, you, you're too well, wait and see, wait and see kind of thing. And it was funny because when you then go after 10 years, was it nearly 10 years, nine years of, of having MS, they were like, well, you know, we probably would have liked to see you started on treatment a little bit earlier. So, well, you didn't give me that option, did you? <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult. I think sometimes not to look back. And that's why I'm so encouraged when you, you know, read about, um, you know, people who are newly diagnosed. And the first thing now the neurologist is saying is we're going to get you on something strong and fast. And and, and I know it's early days, but I, 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 I see that as a change. And I think that is just fantastic. Mm, I agree. And I, and I know a lot of people worry about side effects and things like that. And that's a good one of the good sides yeah. of social media is that, you know, people like you and me were out there, people can sort of ask questions. So, you know, um, if you're on this drug, how did you feel? And, you know, some yeah. people have horrible experiences on some of the yeah. drugs that other people are just like me, nothing. <laughs> but it's, it's so that's uh, peer support groups are good for that kind of just chatting <laughs> about absolutely and and the very fact that there is choices so you say hold on i didn't get along very well on tech Federa. well why don't you tie you know you, you know get glenn I, yes th there are choices rather than no there's one tr drug and you're on it and if you don't get on with it um tough yeah yeah and i suppose that would be another thing that would be interesting to see research in other treatment because like fatigue drugs there's not much on the market on that uh, level and we all know that fatigue is probably the MS symptoms that everybody seems to talk a lot about. No, and I think you raise a really interesting point about hormones. Um, as you said, well, you know, why is it that women during pregnancy um, feel uh, like you did, you know, absolutely on top of the world that you don't have MS? I think there really should be maybe more research into that is, is you know, how do or hormones affect um, is there any possibilities of remyelination? Um, is there any possibility? You know, I think that's a whole area 
that 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 needs to be looked into or maybe just just looking into it a bit more yeah. um, i need to find myself a researcher and we can uh, go for your <laughs> price then <laughs> no, no i think I, I i think it i mean i i do know that there are some women that are pr- during, have felt awful ms wise during pregnancies and they have had relapses and things but but you do hear quite a lot of women who are feeling fine yeah. and i guess a lot of it has to do with the fact that the body's immune system kind of lowers to let, let you carry around yeah. this little parasite <laughs> <laughs> i do love my children really <laughs> <laughs> so apart from research then is there anything else that you're excited about in the for the new year coming up no i just i don't know about you but i just like a calm calm year yeah. i think i think the last couple of years but it's been awful for everybody very difficult but i think particularly people with ms because we're in we're more vulnerable and i think especially those that are on new you know um uh, immunotherapies have just had to be much more careful much more cautious uh so i just want a year where i don't know about you but just quiet quiet and calm, no big nasty surprises going on. Um, and I do feel, you know, encouraged. Yes, there's if there's a lot going wrong in the in the world, and and then there's a lot of things that need to be righted. You know, we were just talking about in the MS community. Um, but I do I I do think that getting diagnosed today with MS, look, it's an appalling disease. I'm I, I'm you know I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat that at all. Mm. But I think there's a lot more options. Um, people, uh, I think now are, can, and, uh, can ask a lot more questions. There's much more, I think more of, a, uh, a patient doctor relationship, um, that they're working together and you, and, 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 and the very fact that you can also, there's now options, you can get second opinions, you can change, you, you can look for what best suits you. And I think, so I think that's uh, all very, very positive things. So, um, I would say to somebody who was getting newly diagnosed today, day do some research and think very very hard about getting on a drug uh say if your neurologist maybe doesn't recommend it on a stronger drug hit it hard hit it fast um because it it is your life you know yeah on the flip side do what's comfortable for you um but but think very strongly about that because yes it is an incurable disease at the moment but it can be treated and um why wait and see to get some nasty um uh, to get some damage um, when you don't have to. I think that was uh, some good parting words there. <laughs> Thank you so much for chatting to me. It's been super interesting. You have to tell us, um, up, keep us up to date what's going on with the with the, the prize as well. Yeah, uh, and, absolutely. And what, and what research comes out of it, because we're excited to see that. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much. And thank you again for the MS Trust and all the work you do. I think it's, it's so key and so important. And I, I just love the way you you keep track of things, but yet you keep it quite personal. Um, so you're not overwhelmed with information. And 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 um I just think, you know, especially through podcasts and things like that, where you're speaking to people with MS, um, but also with the, you know, a variety of experts and advisors who who um you know who can tell us more about the research and the important work they're doing. So so thank you and thank you. <laughs> trust <laughs> thank you so much they're very kind words thank you now if this was commercial commercial podcast here's where there would be an advert but as we're a charity we don't do that so instead we'd like to take this opportunity to tell you all about our uh, new publications that we're bringing out this week actually if you've been to see your ms team to talk about disease modifying drugs the chances are that you might have come across our book on the topic as well And we know that the nurses often give them out to patients in the clinic. This year, we've updated the book with lots of the latest drug information. And we've also have a companion book that has a chart where you can compare some of the different disease modifying drugs um, in an easy way. So if you'd like to see these, head to shop.mstrust.org.uk and click on treatments. It's all free and it can be down- downloaded as digital or you can also request a physical copy too. And now let's move on to our other guest, Helen, from the health professionals team at the MS Trust. Hi there, welcome back to the MS Trust podcast, Multiple Sclerosis, Breaking It Down. I'm Nick, one of the hosts for the show, and today I'm joined by 
a colleague from our health professionals team, Helen. Hello, Helen. Hi there, Nick. Do you know, Helen, we've got lots of things coming up for the year. This podcast, we're looking at what 2023 will bring. Um, and I hear there's lots of uh, exciting things happening on your end from the education programmes. Could you tell us a little bit more? So our um, education programmes are designed for health professionals who specialise in supporting people living with MS. That includes nurses, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, um, speech and language therapists and, and many more different professions. And as you say, we do have an exciting year coming up. We've got three courses running throughout the year for health professionals who are new in role. Um, we have our annual conference in March that has uh, around 300 people attending that. And we're also in the process of planning an advanced course uh, for health professionals who want to do a bit more further learning. Uh, alongside the kind of the in-person events, um, we also have loads of resources on our website, lots of learning and development content for health professionals. Wow, amazing. And the, there's a, a development module coming up in January. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. We're quite busy at the moment preparing for our first course of the year, which starts on the 23rd of January. We've got 26 health professionals who are fairly new to their role um, coming along. That's a mixture of nurses, occupational therapists, physiotherapists and palliative care. Um, and we cover a range of topics, um, starting right at the basics of what is MS, um, covering different treatment options, different symptoms and how to best manage those, um, providing lots of resources to help our health professionals uh, support the people that they're working with. Yeah, and I mean, it's definitely one thing that I've learned since joining the Trust is um, all of the work that goes on from the health professional side um, and supporting people with MS um, and, and giving that training to, to health professionals so that, um, you know, people with MS get the best possible care that they can from the health professional. So I think it's, it's great to hear that there's so much going on. Um, and from kind of last year um, to this year, have there been any big changes or the education programme? I think for us, um, last year was very much trying to catch up with people who hadn't been able to do the training they'd wanted to do during the pandemic. Uh, so we have generally been oversubscribed to everything uh, that we've been doing. That's why we're running three courses for health professionals who are new in their specialism, um, because we do have a lot of demand to catch up with. So that's we've usually run two a year and we're going to be doing three a year this year um, but we will you know obviously continue to develop um, content that's relevant to needs as well uh, making sure that people with MS are getting the best service possible from their health professionals and every time we run a course we're working closely with our colleagues within the MS Trust so we work closely with the inquiry service to make sure we cover hot topics that are important for people living with MS we work closely with the information team to make sure that all the content we're providing to health professionals is up to date. And we provide um, packs of all our information resources to the health professionals to take away. So they've got all of those to refer to and to share um, with the people that they're seeing in clinic. It sounds like um, that, you know, people with MS are kind of at the heart of, of what comes from this training for the health Absolutely. professionals. Yes, absolutely. We uh, we try to make all the content um, patient centric. It's all about the care that uh, the health professionals are providing. We do actually have some expert patients come along um, to deliver some sessions so that people are really getting a good understanding of the different aspects of, of living with MS. It's so important, isn't it, to, to keep, you know, who we're supporting at, at the forefront, isn't it? Um, yeah, so alongside definitely. some of those um, expert patients, who else will be leading and, and delivering the courses? The Some of the courses we deliver are accredited um, by Birmingham University and we work with academic advisors from the university. And uh, generally we work with a range of experts from around the UK who very kindly offer their time and their knowledge to support us at the MS Trust. 
delivering different pieces of content um, based on their specialty. So we're, we're really lucky that we have uh, a really great group of neurologists, specialist nurses, physiotherapists who have been working in MS for a long time and are happy to share their experience and knowledge and pass that on to the next generation of health professionals who are starting their careers. So Helen, from some of the people who attend the development modules, um, what's next for some of those people who've, who've had that training? Yeah, that, that's great. That's a really relevant question for this year because we're starting to see people who have been on our development courses now coming along to train the next generation of specialist health professionals. So we have a few people coming to conference to run various seminars for us who have um, been trained on our development module. We've been running the course for many years, so um, it's really nice to see that kind of generational experience sharing happening. Amazing to hear um, and I suppose, is is there anything else that you'd, you'd like people with MS to know about your education programmes? I think it's just to um, let you know that the great information that the MS Trust provides for people living with MS also forms the basis of the information that we're giving in our courses to um, the health professionals um, that you see when you visit your various clinics. Um, so we do try to be very consistent in the information we provide on the different um, drug therapies, on the different ways to manage symptoms. And we're always trying to make sure we approach uh, each symptom in a holistic manner, that we look at not just drug treatments, but physiotherapy, um, adaptations that can be done in day to day life, uh, just to make sure that uh, the health professionals that we're working with really are providing the very best that they can. Um, for the people that they're looking after. I think just listening to you, to you there, I think I can really see a, a picture of the research side of things, informing the training with the health professionals and then around to, to people with MS um, who are accessing some of those services. So I, I can really see how, how it all fits together. So and keeping up to date with all of these things is really important to us. Obviously, we're updating our materials all the time but we also make sure that um, our education team and the experts that we're working with are regularly attending conferences where there's new research being presented and making sure that that's then fed into the content that's in our courses. A big thank you then to Helen and the rest of the health professional team who are busy behind the scenes getting everything ready for the development modules and the conferences this year. Thank you Helen. Thanks, Nick, for having us. And uh, just to wish everybody a happy, healthy and busy 2023. And we're back. Lots of things happening in, in 2023, it looks like. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was, you, you know, it's great to hear um, from Helen there about the conference and some of the, the programmes that they have for for the nurses within the world of MS. Uh, and also great to hear from yourself, Helena and Rachel, about some of that research that's coming out and the, and the prize and uh, that Rachel's been developing. I think it's really inspiring, the prize, actually. I, I do think it's it's really nice to sort of see that women are being um, sort of celebrated in, in the field of research, but also like really encouraged about it. And, and as Rachel mentioned, you know, because predominantly women have MS uh, you know th it feels like there needs to be a little bit more looked into and uh, that obviously there's lots of men having MS as well they're not being forgotten about <laughs> but I feel like there are things like hormones and stuff that would be quite interesting to 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 definitely learn a bit more about so it'd be very interesting to see where the price goes uh, but I'm sure Rachel will keep us uh, uh, up to date with that um, and I think it's really interesting to hear you know things about what we're getting up to as well I, I know that the health professionals really value uh the sort of the education events that uh the ms trust put on for them i've been along to to the ms trust conference a few times and it's amazing to sort of listen to all the speakers and and things because you get all these you know fantastic neurologists and health professionals and specialists that talk about all kinds of different interesting um subjects and um, now it is for health professionals and not for like you, you, sadly not um people who aren't in that world can't like pop along to the conference and learn but we do always try to attend and take reports from it and ask the experts some questions and then publicize that on our website and sort of spread the knowledge around <laughs> as it was so people with MS can get it as well.
Yeah, definitely. And looking forward to seeing how that goes too. And definitely looking forward to 2023 myself. Um, my New Year's resolution was to try and get a little bit fitter. Um, so <laughs> I was wondering, um, maybe some people out there might have some different New Year's resolutions. Maybe you might, like me, maybe not be uh, quite as far down the road of your New Year's resolution as, as you'd like to be. Um, but potentially maybe one that you might like to do is is volunteer. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, Helena, if you could tell us a little bit about um, volunteers with the MS Trust. Yeah, I think, you know, volunteering is such a great thing to do. Um, everybody, it, people who do um, New Year's resolutions, you know, the whole getting fit and, and eating healthy is it was always a like a firm favorite isn't it but I feel like there's been quite a lot of people that said to me that they'd like to do some volunteering and things like that this year I would do volunteer myself for my local park run and I find that like really uh, it's it's lovely because you feel like you're helping the community you make meet some new friends and and, and get to know new people and you, you're doing some good doing good makes you feel good I, I'm a strong believer of that and uh, and uh, you know I know that within the world of the MS Trust, we're always looking for for people to to help out with things, and and we love our volunteers. I mean, uh, we have people helping us out with the sort of the Facebook group, uh, guest moderators. Uh, we've had people who helped us uh, edit this podcast before, uh, and he will he actually did a few episodes as well. There further down, if you go click a little bit further down in our list, you can can listen to some of the things that he did. He was a great volunteer. And we, you know, uh, we've had people who who help us putting together music and and uh, do sc script writing and all sorts of things. So so if if people have the extra time to give and they they, they want to sort of help a charity out, then I think that's a really good way to to approach. Uh, uh, well, I mean, we would love it if you approach us. I was going to say any charity, but obviously the MS Trust would love <laughs> to have you. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, it's so important, isn't it? And as, as I say, Helena, it's a great way to potentially learn some new skills or share some of your expertise as well. So we we're, we're always would be keen to hear from you. So if you would like to get involved with volunteering with the MS Trust, head to www.mstrust.org.uk forward slash get involved forward slash volunteering. Um, alternatively, if you head to our MS Trust website and head for the search bar and, and go for volunteering, then the page will show you as well. And you can read some interesting stories about people who have already volunteered, uh, like uh, Caroline that I mentioned, who is uh, one of the uh, guest uh, moderators on our Facebook group. So it's, it's some interesting stories to read there as well, to inspire you to see what you could maybe maybe get up to. Finally, if you have any questions about MS, the MS Trust is, is always here for you. You can call our inquiry service our helpline, which is um, open on Mondays to Fridays from 9am to 5pm. Outside of those hours, you can always leave a message and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So give our inquiry service a call on 0800 032 3839 or you can email ask at mstrust.org.uk. And if you want to get in touch uh, with the MS Trust, you can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and Instagram. Um, and you can find this uh, this podcast uh, on Spotify, Google and Apple Podcast and Amazon Music and, and some other places where you would normally listen to your podcast as well. Uh, and you can also watch this podcast if you would want to uh, on uh, YouTube uh, as well. And, uh, you know, like we said before, please get in touch and, and we love it if you like and subscribe. And if you spread spread this podcast around for anyone who would uh, want to listen to the podcast. Um, and we, finally, we would also like to say a big thank you to Anne Chapman Audio for the music to this podcast. And um, looking forward to seeing you all and hearing from you all in uh, 2023.